I have a lot of nostalgia for The Wind Waker. As some of you may know, I didn't grow up in the 80s or even the 90s, and to some people, that may be enough reason to disregard every word that comes out of my mouth. I am a 2000s kid. I was only 5 when the Xbox 360 came out. Hell, I was only 5 when YouTube hit the scene. Regardless, I still grew up playing a fair amount of older titles from the N64 and SNES eras, but NES games eluded me for the longest time. It wasn't until I got a 3DS, believe it or not, that I was introduced to those games. Which means that I inevitably missed out on experiencing the first Zelda game as it was meant to be experienced. No online walkthroughs, no map printed from GameFAQs, none of that. When I did get around to playing it, I used a guide, and so, I completely lost out on the feeling of adventure that the game was meant to elicit. And looking back, it's really a shame that, because of my age, I'll never truly be able to appreciate Zelda 1 in the context of what it was like playing it completely blind. But at the very least, I can say that I have played a game that, essentially, served the same role, one that I went into with the goal of discovering everything it had to offer for myself. A game that had me glued to my GameCube for hours on end. A game that immersed me in what felt like a boundless world that satisfied my need for adventure, and what an adventure it was. A game that served as my Zelda 1, and the game I will be talking about today. This is The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Majora's Mask was released in North America in October of 2000. It was a game made under a unique set of circumstances, designed in a way to minimize development time by reusing assets from Ocarina of Time. The final product was noticeably smaller in scale than its predecessor because of this. If you really think about it, even with unlimited time and resources, there's only so much that could be done to evolve a series when working with the same hardware. Nintendo knew this, and fans knew this. So before Majora's Mask even came out, nearly all eyes were already on a completely different console that would deliver the true next leap forward for Zelda. The GameCube had its proper unveil at Space World 2000, showing off graphics that were leaps and bounds more advanced than what the N64 could do. But it was this short clip of Link and Ganondorf battling it out in an epic sword clashing duel that really turned heads. For the time, the graphics on display here were next level, just absolutely mind blowing. While this wasn't confirmed to be an actual game in development, fans knew that the GameCube would soon have a new Zelda the game of its own, and having this as a taste of what was to come made the actual reveal a year later all the more disappointing. So instead of a realistic Zelda game following in the footsteps of Ocarina of Time, at Space World 2001, it was revealed that the GameCube Zelda game was actually going for a cel shaded art style, with drastically different character designs that were more cartoony, and therefore bad. Audiences were not very happy with what they were shown. They wanted something more akin to the tech demo from the previous year, but that's all it was, a tech demo. Aonuma actually hated the demo. The Zelda team wanted to try something new instead of exhausting what came before, hence what we ended up getting. Miyamoto, notably, wasn't a fan of the cel shaded presentation either, and had correctly predicted that a lot of fans wouldn't be fond of it. Despite the hesitation on Miyamoto's part, the team stuck with their instincts and kept the art style, and while the game received more positive feedback at E3 the following year, the damage was already done. When it was released on December 13th, 2002 in Japan and everywhere else a couple months later, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker garnered near unanimous praise from those who actually played the game, but the initial backlash and the fact that the GameCube ended up being Nintendo's worst selling home console at the time, caused Wind Waker to sell a whole 3 million copies less than Ocarina of Time, which to Nintendo was a financial disappointment. Even though one would think that this would make them want to avoid this art style like the plague, it ended up being the most reused art style in the franchise. The Four Swords games, Minish Cap, the DS games, Triforce Heroes, and Toon Link himself has gone down as one of the most iconic and distinct incarnations of Link. Wind Waker's development didn't have the same strict time limit that Majora's Mask had, but there were still lots lots of things that were cut from the final version so that it could launch during the holiday season. Seeing as the vast Great Sea was obviously the main focus, it makes sense that some things were sacrificed in favor of having this massive ocean to explore. But man, reading about some of this kinda hurts. Concept art shows that some interesting looking islands and a possible aging mechanic for Link were likely scrapped. Digging through the game's files, fans have found references to water boots and two different sail icons. The water boots interest me the most since I always thought it was weird that a game with this much water has no underwater water exploration unlike basically every other 3D Zelda game. The largest bits of cut content, however, have to be the two dungeons that didn't make the cut. Jumping the gun a bit here, but if Wind Waker feels incomplete in any aspect, it has to be its dungeons. And it's pretty obvious after playing the game where these two scrap dungeons were meant to fit in. But you know what? 
Screw the cut content. I love Wind Waker just the way it is. I have problems with the game, no doubt, but games like this, Melee, and Super Mario Sunshine just take me back to simpler times. When Majora's Mask didn't really click with me the first time, I had Wind Waker to fill the void. Another Zelda game for me to try out. One that was so damn hard to find. I had the sh Obvious luck tracking down a copy of this game as a kid. I'd go to GameStop and this one retro game store every time I went to the mall with my family, and they never had Wind Waker. Instead, there was always a copy of Shadow the Hedgehog rotting on the shelf for five bucks. I remember once I actually found a copy of Wind Waker, but I didn't have any money with me, and I didn't have a phone, so I hauled ass to the food court to tell my dad to lend me 20 bucks. Yes, this was when used GameCube games didn't cost an arm and a leg to buy. And when I came back, of course, it was gone. It's a painful memory that I will forever associate with Wind Waker, but eventually, I found it. I still remember the car ride home, opening the case, being in awe of the gold disc, looking through the manual, and I think this was when I was on summer vacation, and I couldn't think of a better way to spend it than by playing Wind Waker for countless hours, and that's exactly what I did. It was my favorite Zelda game yet, without a doubt. So when the announcement of an HD remake of Wind Waker was casually dropped in the January 2013 Direct, I lost my f***ing mind. Now I have to have a Wii U to play a slightly updated version of a game I already own. I mean, I was already gonna buy a Wii U one day for Smash Bros, but Wind Waker HD just seemed like it was meant to be the game that would ultimately make me buy the system. And that was even more clear to me when Nintendo not only announced that the Wii U Deluxe set was getting a price drop from 350 to 300 bucks, but also revealed this special edition Wii U, bundled with a download code for Wind Waker HD, a download code for Hyrule Historia, and a custom Wii U gamepad with a similar gold touch up found on the Ocarina of Time 3DS. This was the first game console I ever pre-ordered, and on September 20th of that year, I picked it up from GameStop, got home, set it up, and I had to wait till the next day to play the game because I had to download it with shitty Wi-Fi. I was always jealous that I missed out on this incredible special edition for the physical version that came with this badass Ganondorf statue, but hey, at least I got to play the game two weeks earlier than those who got the game physically. Yeah, remember when Nintendo actually included their games with their respective special edition consoles? Ooh, I can't wait to do nothing. It's a shame that I don't have my Wind Waker Wii U anymore. I sold it years ago because that's what I had to do to be able to afford newer games back then. Not one of my finest moments. I did eventually buy another Wii U and was thankfully able to link my Nintendo Network ID to it, so don't worry guys, Hyrule Historia is preserved. But it's not the same. I really do miss that gamepad, even if it's not the most exciting looking special edition controller out there. I used to think that Wind Waker HD was a huge graphical upgrade from the original, but looking back, they didn't really change a whole lot. Like, this isn't going from Ocarina of Time to Ocarina of Time 3D. The reason it looks so different now is because it's running at 1080p and the lighting has been completely redone. And this is where you see a divide among the fans. Some people like the new lighting, while others say that it destroys the original's identity. It doesn't look cell shaded anymore. The character models look very clay-like, especially when put next to strong light sources like torches and the bloom, there's a bit too much of it. You know what, scratch that, there's too much of it, there's straight up too much bloom. Wind Waker's art style is absolutely beautiful. I think that nowadays most people can agree with that. It helps the game remain timeless and it's why the HD version still looks like a modern game with only very minimal tweaks made to textures and character models. It doesn't look like a GameCube game, you know? I think that the two versions look good in their own right for different reasons. I do agree that the original looks more natural, like this is clearly the look that the artists were going for. But I don't think that the HD version looks bad. And if you want to stick with the GameCube version because you prefer its graphics but still want the other benefits of the HD version, you can mod the game with better Wind Waker to do just that. Man, I love fan projects. So about those other benefits. The HD version has a lot going for it. Of course there's the difference in visuals, but the music was also redone. It isn't too different from the original soundtrack, but I do think it sounds a little nicer. It's a shame they didn't use this as an opportunity to bring in an orchestra, and I also would have appreciated an option to swap between the two. Even though the Wii U gamepad never really proved itself worthy of existing, both of the Zelda Wii U remakes have some of my favorite gamepad features on the system. Gyro aiming is great as usual, but the gamepad screen also displays your items and map in real time, so you can use the stylus or your finger to assign items to the X, Y, or R buttons on the fly, and when sailing, you have the map available to you at all times without having to pause the game to view it. I like how this gives you instant access to your treasure charts and lets you position the boat in just the right spot to grab those sunken treasure chests. There's also an option to use the Wii U Pro Controller for the more hardcore crowd that refuse to use the 
gamepad. Look, I don't blame you, I wouldn't want to be caught with one of these either. Other quality of life additions include the sped up animations for the grappling hook, and you can now turn while swinging without having to stop. There's the faster text crawl, the ability to skip the opening cutscene, the fishman hints now being saved on your seat chart, and starting off with a bigger wallet. The picto box can now be used to take selfies, and you can make link to these cute facial expressions. And any pictures you take can be uploaded to Miiverse. And speaking of Miiverse, the Tingle tuner from the GameCube version, which allowed you to take control of Tingle to get certain items by connecting the console to a Game Boy Advance, has now been replaced with a Tingle bottle, giving players a means of sharing messages with the world via Miiverse that would then appear in other players' games washed up on shore in a bottle. That sounds pretty cool. Let's try it out. You knew where this was going. One of the uses of the Tingle Tuner was getting these Tingle statues, by the way, but now you can just reveal them with a regular bomb. And of course, arguably the best new addition, the Swift Sail. It's a completely optional item that can be skipped, but for the love of god, don't skip it. The fact that it doubles your sailing speed is great enough on its own, but my favorite thing about it is that it cuts down on the number of times you have to play the Wind's Requiem since it makes the wind automatically blow in the direction you're facing. This item makes it really hard for me to revisit a version of this game that doesn't have it. I will admit that it's a little sad how much less useful the Wind's Requiem and, therefore, the Wind Waker itself become, but the Swift Sail is so nice to have. Oh yeah, Hero Mode is included now too, doubling the amount of damage you take and removing health drops. But what I really appreciate is that it's unlocked right from the get-go, and you can toggle it on and off at any point on the file select screen. This is the only Zelda game that does this to my knowledge, and I really don't understand why the two Zelda remakes that released after this that have Hero Modes took a step backwards in this regard. Skyward Sword HD technically took two steps back since you still have to beat the main game to unlock its Hero mode. Not much that can be done about that, I suppose. Hi, it's me, from the future. I realized while editing the video that I completely forgot to mention that you can play the whole game on the gamepad screen. I actually did this a lot when I first got the game because my parents would always be watching TV and I'd want to play the game, so I'd just stream it on the gamepad. I'm pretty sure I even did a full playthrough once exclusively on the gamepad. So yeah, back to the review. Those were the major version differences I wanted to go over right now. So without further ado, let's talk about Wind Waker's story, which I've only come to adore more the more times I replay it. Wind Waker takes place about a hundred years after Ocarina of Time, but this doesn't mean that it's a sequel to Majora's Mask. This was going to come up at some point, might as well rip off the band-aid now. The Zelda timeline has been a topic of discussion for as long as I can remember. For years, fans have dedicated a lot of time and research into putting together a cohesive timeline that connects all of the games together. Now, I'm of the opinion that Zelda stories weren't written with the intention of having them all tie together in some way, at least not at first. When Wind Waker and Twilight Princess came out, I think this was around the time that Aonuma and the team started taking the grander timeline into more consideration before eventually releasing an official canon timeline via the Hyrule Historia book. All the craziness happens here in Ocarina of Time's ending, where the timeline splits into three branches. The child timeline, the adult timeline, and the we didn't know where else to fiddle into the past or any of these other games, so we created a new one that implies the existence of a greater multiverse where a different branching path is created every time Link dies timeline. So anyways, Wind Waker fits here in the adult timeline, the future from Ocarina of Time that Link saved before returning to the child timeline that leads to Majora's Mask and Twilight Princess. Wind Waker opens up with a recap of these events, reminding us of how Ganondorf was sealed by the sages after he was defeated. But plot twist, the seal eventually broke and Ganondorf was free to take over Hyrule with no hero of time in sight to come save the day this time. In response to the people's prayers, the gods of Hyrule flooded the entire kingdom, sealing it and Ganondorf away at the bottom of the newly created Great Sea. The survivors made new homes for themselves on the highest points of the land that eventually became the island seen in the present day. On one of these islands, Outset Island, the story of the ancient kingdom and hero has been told for generations, and it is tradition for boys to don the green tunic of the legendary hero when they come of age. This game's incarnation of Link is up next to continue said tradition, one that he doesn't care for all too much, but he's a good kid so he puts up with the weather inappropriate tunic anyways. He's really got no reason to complain. He's got a lovable sister, Errol, a loving grandmother, and lives on a peaceful island where absolutely nothing can go wrong. A giant bird being shot at by a pirate ship nearby loses its grip on the young girl it was carrying, sending her falling into the nearby forest. Link, being the good boy he is, takes a sword in hand and heads to the forest to help out. He saves the girl, a cool pirate named Tetra, and upon exiting the forest, he meets up with his sister. But the reunion is cut off when the giant bird from earlier swoops in and takes Errol away. Feeling guilty about the situation since the bird was originally after her, Tetra offers to take Link to the Forsaken Fortress where Errol is likely being held captive. Unfortunately, this
this means that Link has to say goodbye to his home and his grandmother in what has to be one of the most gut-wrenching scenes in the series. Wind Waker's story already gets points from me for giving Link personal stakes to deal with. At this point, there's no call to action from some prophecy or world-ending moon in the sky. Link is just a kid, a very brave kid who loves his family and just wants to save his sister. I think we can all think back to a moment in our lives where our responsibilities have separated us from our loved ones, which makes this farewell so powerful. It's something a lot of people can relate to and it kicks the game off in a strong way. But enough about that, here's some good old slapstick. Link gets launched inside of the Forsaken Fortress and eventually finds where his sister and other girls from around the sea are being held captive, but is unfortunately grabbed by the same giant bird before he can do anything. He comes face to face with a sinister looking man before being thrown far away into the sea. Thankfully, he's saved by a boat. Like, a sentient boat. He introduces himself as the King of Red Lions and tells Link about the evil brewing behind the scenes. The man at the Forsaken Fortress is Ganondorf, the same one from the legend, who has returned and is in no doubt searching for the missing pieces of the golden power he tried to obtain all those years ago. The only way to stop him is with the Master Sword, and to find the blade, Link must travel the Great Sea by using the Wind Waker to control the wind to find the three goddess pearls held by the three guardian spirits. Link manages to find two of the pearls, along the way befriending Medley of the Rito tribe, an attendant and big sister of source to the Rito Prince Kamali. Medley is just the sweetest character. Sorry about the concussion, by the way. Link also befriends Mikau, a young Korok who. Um. The third pearl is supposed to be in possession of the water spirit at Greatfish Isle, but the island is in absolute shambles when they arrive, destroyed by Ganondorf as he's picked up on what Link and the King of Red Lions are trying to do. This kicks off the Endless Night. Ganondorf hasn't had much of a presence up until this point, so seeing how he's able to place the entire Great Sea under a never-ending stormy night starts building him up more as a villain that's not to be messed with. Plus, gameplay-wise, this part is really memorable. Lightning is constantly lighting up the dark sky as you're sailing, the music changes to be more menacing and foreboding and also beautifully incorporates Ganon's theme. A lot of people like to try to get as much item collection and stuff done as they can during this part because of how unique the atmosphere is compared to the rest of the game. Link learns that the water spirit Jaboon has fled to Outset Island to hide from Ganondorf's wrath, so he goes to Windfall to steal some bombs that Tetra's pirate crew were also planning to steal, and uses them to blast away the rock blocking the cave where Jaboon is hiding. He gives the boy the final pearl, but before leaving, you can take this opportunity to say hello to the island's residents after having been away from home for so long. Most importantly, you can visit your grandmother, who has fallen ill. You can heal her with a fairy and witness a touching reunion. This gives you access to the elixir soup that you can come back and get a refill of any time you want. It restores all of your health and magic like a blue potion and doubles your attack power until the next time you get hit, which gives your sword this awesome glow too. And because your grandma loves you so much, your bottle is filled with enough soup for two servings. This tugs at my heartstrings, man. Whoever decided to make the grandma's home cooking item the best bottled item in the game deserves a freaking medal. After placing all three of the goddess pearls on the goddess statues on the Triangle Islands, the Tower of the Gods rises from beneath the sea, and Link receives another body-shattering injury for his trouble. Link passes the tower's trials and opens a portal leading to a kingdom under the sea that's been frozen in time. Entering the castle, Link finds the Master Sword's chamber and pulls it out of its pedestal, ready to return to the Forsaken Fortress to save his sister and defeat Ganondorf. After getting Errol to safety with the help of Tetra and the pirates, Link has a cathartic rematch with the Helmrock King, showing just how far the boy has come since the start of his journey, and then confronts Ganondorf, not knowing that this absolute unit has an ace up his sleeve. In another classic womp womp moment, Ganondorf reveals that in pulling out the Master Sword, Link inadvertently unlocked the seal containing the last bit of his magic. On top of that, the Master Sword is not even in its final form, allowing Ganondorf to easily gain the upper hand here. Tetra eventually arrives to help because she's just a badass like that, but she accidentally gives away that she is the girl that Ganondorf has been searching for, Princess Zelda. All hope seems lost until the Rito arrive to save the two children just in the nick of time before the sky spirit Valu burns the place to the ground. The King of Red Lines tells Link to take Tetra to the room where the Master 
Luxor slept. And when they arrive, the two come face to face with King Daphnis Nohansen Hyrule, the last king of Hyrule and the one who's been communicating with Link through the King of Red Alliance all this time. He brings the two up to speed, how the kingdom they're in is in fact the same Hyrule from the legends. And now that Ganondorf knows that Tetra is Zelda, the one who holds the Triforce of Wisdom, he'll stop at nothing to find her. Tetra is noticeably confused about all of this, which I've always found to be odd. It's never been entirely clear to me how much Tetra knows and doesn't know about her origin. You can explore her cabin when you return to Windfall Island for the bombs, and see that she has pictures of the legend from the game's intro, and a picture of the Triangle Islands forming the shape of the Triforce hanging on her wall. She also recognizes the Master Sword when she sees it on Link's back at the Forsaken Fortress. She has to be at least a little familiar with what the King is talking about, so I've never really understood why she reacts the way she does here. This is just a minor nitpick though, and I might be missing something. Even still, when her identity is revealed, it's hard not to feel bad for her. There's clearly a lot of emotions running through her at this moment as she comes to terms with her new role in this world, the amount of danger she's in, and the trouble she has unintentionally gotten Link into since the start of the game. Wind Waker has no voice acting, par for the course for the series at this point, but never before have characters in a Zelda game been so expressive. Never have they shown so much about what they're thinking through the way they physically emote. It's what gives these scenes so much of their impact. The expressive animation and art style serve this game's story wonderfully, making comedic moments that much more hilarious, and making serious moments that much more engaging. This game may have a colorful exterior, but the mature themes and subtext that so many fans love about the series are still present. Link and Tetra aren't the only characters who suddenly have big responsibilities dropped on their laps that completely alter their lives. As part of the second act of the game, the quest to restore power to the Master Sword, Link helps Medley and Makar awaken as the Sages of the Earth and Wind Temples respectively. The two are essentially forced to pick up the mantle, since Gan Ganondorf stole the souls of the temple's original sages, which I think is just rated E for everyone language for, he f***ing killed them. They are forced to leave their lives and friends behind for a purpose bigger than they could possibly comprehend. Even though they gladly accept their calling, like Medley for example is just happy she was able to do her part helping Prince Kamali find his independence, there's a bittersweet feeling to all of this that makes me sympathize a great deal with these characters. Even if I feel Makar could have had a bit more development. These kids are all victims to an accursed legend. They are all paying the consequences for the older generation's mistakes and their obsession with reviving an ancient past. It takes a great deal of courage to take these responsibilities in stride. Courage that Link becomes worthy of wielding after he restores the Master Sword's true power and explores the sea to find the eight pieces of the Triforce of Courage. He unfortunately wasted so much time playing bullshit minigames on Windfall that Ganondorf discovered Zelda's location and kidnapped her, taking her to his tower where he awaits Link for the final showdown. By the time he reaches Ganondorf, Link is so exhausted from the battles leading up to this point that he gets his ass handed to him. To be fair, he was probably probably a little distracted when Ganondorf started getting all philosophical on him out of the blue. While I think it's cool when he's just a super evil dickhead of a villain, Ganondorf can be so much more interesting if the time is taken to give his character proper motivations, and this game is proof of that. This is my favorite iteration of Ganondorf by far, and after my most recent playthrough I can say that it's not even close. Oh sorry, I completely forgot about this guy. Ganondorf in this game is stuck in the past, furious over his failure at the hands of the Hero of Time and furious at the gods for robbing him of his second chance of taking over Hyrule when they flooded the whole land just to stop him. His goal is to unflood Hyrule so that he can finally conquer it, which is obviously bad given the way he wants to do it, but man, you've gotta admire this man's sheer dedication to make his goal a reality. His eye is set on one thing and one thing only, even making it clear to Link that he has no intention of killing him, which I mean, yeah, why would he? He has what he wants. He won. Killing Link and Zelda, at least right now, wouldn't benefit him at all as they're in no shape to stop him anyway. It would simply be a waste of time. Ganondorf's tenacity and obsession in this game is what makes him such a great villain, but it's also what leads to his downfall. Because those who cling to the past are doomed to repeat it. And in a cruel twist of fate, Ganondorf once again misses his chance to use the Triforce to make his wish come true because he forgot to read the fine print in the instructions. King Daphnis, on the other hand, did read the fine print. He touches the Triforce, wishing for Hyrule to be permanently sealed off once and for all and for Ganondorf to drown with it, and to grant Lincoln Zelda, the new generation, a future. Ganondorf's insane fit of laughter in this part always gives me chills, and he throws the whole I'm not going to kill you thing out the window 
now that he has basically failed. He has nothing left to lose at this point. This all leads to an incredible final battle. The music, the water pouring down around the arena, the fact that Zelda is helping you during the fight, the fact that it's an actual sword duel and not another game of hitting a glowing ball back and forth, the buildup and twists that led up to this moment, this might just be my favorite final battle in any Zelda game. Definitely in my top three. And that finishing blow, freaking perfect. At least it would be if it didn't glitch out when I captured footage for this video. <sighs> With Ganondorf defeated, King Daphnis expresses his desire for Link and Zelda to return to their homes and to look towards the future, to move forward, and to forgive their ancestors for leaving them with a ruined world. If I had to judge the King of Red Lions based solely on his role as your bow and companion, I'd say that he's one of the lamer partners in the series. But actually learning about his regret and guilt makes him so much more compelling. There's a tragedy to his character not unlike Ganondorf's. I think these two characters complemented each other really well. Link and Tetra wake up floating in the Great Sea where they're reunited with their friends and family. And during the post credit scene, the two set sail towards wherever the wind takes them in search of a new land. Link has to say goodbye to his home and family again, but under different circumstances this time. No feelings of fear or uncertainty, rather hope. I do think some elements of Wind Waker's story are left undercooked, and it's undoubtedly a result of the rush development I talked about earlier. Things like the missing dungeon that was so obviously supposed to be the location of the final goddess pearl, Makar having noticeably less attention given to him compared to Medley, the fact that there's only two sages to awaken when it really feels like it should have been three, which is what the other cut dungeon would have been for, all stick out to me. But Wind Waker still manages to deliver one of the most timeless stories a Zelda game has told. Link, Zelda, and Ganondorf have never been this fleshed out, and new characters are given similar amounts of depth. I've already praised Ganondorf, but Tetra slash Zelda deserves a lot of praise too. Her growth in this story and her personality are really fun to watch. This is just such an entertaining, motivational coming-of-age tale that I will never tire of. And the line, the wind will guide us not only pertains to the game's message, but also its gameplay and the reason I fell in love with it as a kid. The way Wind Waker makes you feel like an adventurer. The Great Sea is Wind Waker's main attraction. It's definitely a love it or hate it part of the game. Some of the criticisms that apply to overworlds like Hyrule Field can be applied to the Great Sea as well. Although there are 49 islands for you to discover, not all of them are that exciting to explore. Especially not the ones like the I Reef Islands that reuse the same idea six times. The ocean is massive and other than the occasional rupee minigame, cyclone, enemy, and watchtower, there isn't a whole lot to do in the empty space that separates each island. But here's what makes the Great Sea so, well, great. Before Breath of the Wild, it was the closest that the series ever got to recapturing the level of freedom that the first Zelda game was so famous for. Wind Waker isn't non-linear. You can't break the sequence of story events with only a few exceptions, like being able to tackle the Earth and Wind Temples in any order you want, which in retrospect really makes me wish that this was the case with Dragon Roost Cavern and the Forbidden Woods as well. But not long after you get a sail for your boat, you can literally go wherever you want. This doesn't mean you'll be able to do much since in traditional Zelda fashion, Fashion, you'll need to expand your arsenal to gain access to many of the game's areas and collectibles. But it might be the triumphant music that plays while you're sailing, that whimsical desire in all of us to travel the seven seas and search for treasure, the sea chart you fill out and the treasure charts you find that further feed into that desire, or all of the above, that captures the spirit of adventure that only the greatest sandboxes are able to do. It encourages players to craft their own journey and even to make their own sea chart. As a kid, I drew a map of the Great Sea that I I continuously updated the more I explored it. I wrote down the clues that the fishman gives you, and there was nothing more satisfying than piecing together some of these clues that led me to an incredible reward or an unforgettable moment. I'd visit islands that had boulders or giant pegs sticking out of the ground, so I'd write down that I needed bombs or a hammer in the square that contained that island so that, when I did get those items, I'd have something to make immediate use out of them. When I'd find special charts, the ones that tell you which squares have pieces of heart and submarines and water watchtowers, I'd combine all of that information in my sea chart. It looked like a f***ing mess, but it helped me keep track of the things that I had already collected. Playing Wind Waker this way made for an experience that will forever live in my memory. Like I said in the beginning of the video, Wind Waker was my Zelda 1. That game also encouraged players to get out a piece of paper and pencil, to draw their own maps, keep track of 
of all the points of interest they found and all the cryptic hints they'd get from the old man. Wind Waker employed a more modern, more accessible version of that same design philosophy. Its open world is so fun to explore because of it, and it's why those occasional uninteresting islands and the time it takes to get from one point to another don't really bother me. There's a sense of gratification from how Wind Waker rewards you for exploring, because your discoveries feel earned, like when that treasure chart you found leads you to a piece of heart. And then there's those times when you manage to stumble on something by complete accident. I remember when I randomly found the ghost ship and it scared the shit out of me. I actually turned around to avoid it, but then I found the ghost ship chart and realized that I had to board it for one of the Triforce charts. I love how the game places the fire mountain on the path from Dragon Roost to Forest Haven so that it's almost impossible to miss. Seeing it for the first time at night left me totally awestruck, and when I found the ice mountain, I knew the two had to be linked in some way. I love how there isn't any set pattern in terms of where you find collectibles. You can find pieces of heart in caves, beneath the sea, on watchtowers, but my favorite example of this are the great fairies. Obviously they're found at the fairy islands, but not all of them are. There's the one hidden in Outset Island's forest, and the one that just appears after defeating one of the big octos out at sea. Like this is something I'd expect out of a randomizer. And this also happens to be the great fairy that doubles your magic meter. Such a helpful upgrade hidden in the middle of nowhere. It's not as random or cryptic as I might be making it seem by the way. You learn about this great fairy from one of the fishman hints. There's also the wind god Cyclos who you can randomly run into when you see a giant tornado. Earlier in the game, his brother tells you about him, adding to the list of things to keep an eye out for in the open sea. If you can shoot him with an arrow, he teaches you a song that unlocks fast travel. Wind Waker takes inspiration from Majora's Mask by encouraging you to talk to people around the great sea to learn about new areas of interest and quests that range from being completely optional to absolutely required. If this was any other Zelda game, you just know that getting things like the Cabana Deed and finding the ghost ship would be side content, not mandatory steps needed to finish the game. Exploration is a vital part of the core of Wind Waker's gameplay, and you need to look no further than the game's most infamous quest to realize this. So this is the part of the video where I tell you that I actually really like the Triforce quest. Is it time consuming? Yes. But it ties together all of the exploration you've done so far, and serves as a great payoff for players who have gone out of their way to gather as much money as they can, fill out as much of the sea chart as they can, and accumulate a wealth of knowledge through the clues and rumors they've learned throughout their journey. The hunt for the Triforce is a big callback to Zelda 1, and if Wind Waker didn't already remind you of that game by this point, well, the similarities are even more apparent now. You've acquired every main item, every upgrade to your boat. The Great Sea is completely open to you now, and how long it takes you to find every Triforce shard will all depend depend on how much progress you've made in surveying every inch of this world. In a way, it's a little disappointing that the HD version gets rid of most of the Triforce charts. Sure, this means that it's a lot more convenient when you just get a piece of the Triforce with no strings attached, and this makes it so you don't have to grind so much for rupees like in the GameCube version. But I don't know, I think that just including the Swift sale and perhaps lowering the price of deciphering each Triforce chart would have pleased both the fans and detractors of this part of the game. As you may expect, Wind Waker is packed with side content. Don't expect these side quests to be as good as Majora's Mask side quests though. No Zelda game has been able to match Majora in that respect, so I don't really see a point in comparing the two. Though Wind Waker has a lot more in common with that game than I remembered. Of course there's Tingle, but there's also side quests involving the returning Picto box. Windfall Island has its own gang of children like the bombers in Clocktown. There's even a character who kind of reminds me of the Happy Mask Salesman, only instead of being obsessed with masks, this guy is obsessed with figurines. This is the Nintendo Gallery quest, and it's the only one I never really do when I replay this game. You have to take pictures of every character, enemy, boss, you name it, and show them to this guy to amass a collection of figurines. The problem is that you can only store up to 12 pictures at a time, at least in the HD version. In the GameCube version, that number goes down to 3. All you get for completing it is a figurine of Link and the King of Red Alliance, so yeah, not really worth it if you ask me. Another side quest I'm not that big of a fan of is the Goron trading quest. I just think it's really repetitive, but at the very least you get all these items you can use to decorate when Fall Island with for another one of the side quests, or you can be boring like me and just use the same flower over and over again. You do also get the magic armor from completing the trade quest, an item that is absolutely broken. It makes you invincible at the cost of losing rupees every time you get hit, which isn't really an issue in a game where you'll be opening dozens of treasure chests containing an ass load of money. Yeah, this game doesn't let up on how many rupees there are to collect. The biggest wallet holds 5,000 rupees, 10 times more than the biggest wallets in the N64 games. So if you have the money to spare, 
pocket. The armor is especially handy when you decide to take on the Savage Labyrinth, which I'll talk about later. My favorite side quest has to be the one involving this douchebag. At the beginning of the game, you can find this guy sulking around Windfall Island, asking you to help save his daughter from the Forsaken Fortress. There's another girl from Windfall who was also kidnapped, the daughter of the wealthiest family on the island, and by the time you saved your sister and all the other kidnapped girls, the family is completely broke as they spent all their money trying to get their daughter back, pushing the girl to resort to stealing, which she thankfully realizes is a bad thing, and learns to just accept her new life after you catch her in the act. She may have had a change of heart, but this guy becomes a huge dick, since his daughter returned with a bunch of skull necklaces that are worth a fortune, allowing them to become the new richest family in Windfall. How did his daughter get these necklaces? Because while she was captured, she entered a relationship with one of the Moblin guards. A f King Moblin. Windfall Island is the biggest island in the game, and it is filled with wacky characters like these. It's the closest the game gets to having a clock town like area. There aren't many other islands that compare to its size and variety of NPCs, and those that do, like Outset and Dragon Roost, are nowhere near as packed with things to do. But Dragon Roost still reigns supreme in its music, a top tier Zelda song without a doubt. On Windfall, you have the local gossipers, the contraband vendor, the Elvis cosplayer, and this ray of sunshine who hosts the most infuriating minigame. The squids spawn in random locations every time, and I always have the worst luck with this thing. Every Zelda game seems to have that one minigame that people hate, and this is Wind Waker's. <laughs> Wind Waker has quite a good selection of minigames overall, I'd say. The letter sorting one is one of my favorites. It requires really good reaction time to get 25 points. I also quite like the Withered Tree side quest, since it tests how many Koroks you've managed to find around the world, and how fast you can get to all of them before the forest water reverts back to regular water, though the swift sail and more lenient time limit in the HD version make this a pretty easy quest to complete. A minigame I don't like though is sparring with Orca. You have to hit him 500 times to get the piece of heart. And it's not like it's hard to not get hit yourself, it's just really boring. Also, I don't recommend parrying here since it can be kind of finicky and can lead you to getting hit instead of properly counterattacking. Other than this instance, I really like the parry. It makes combat more reactive and visually, it's satisfying to pull off. Combat in this game is incredibly fluid. Swinging your sword can now be chained into a 4 hit combo that ends with a powerful finisher that knocks enemies on their asses. When you do this, enemies can drop their own weapons that you can pick up and use. Some of these weapons are sometimes used for puzzles and dungeons, but they can also serve as straight up replacements for your sword if you want. I'm not usually the biggest fan of using other weapons, with the exception of the longer reaching and more powerful ones that really pack a punch when you manage to land a direct hit with them. This is the most skilled Link has ever been combat wise, and you have to use a combination of your regular sword combos, parrying, and items to gain the upper hand in some of those more difficult late game fights. I love fighting dark nuts in this game and how you have to slash away at their armor. Mini blinds can be pretty annoying to fight when they gang up on you, but them being here actually gives me a reason to use the skull hammer in combat because you can use it to squash the hell out of them, it's great. The main enemy group I don't like fighting are moblins, only because they have these really cheap attacks that come out in an instant that are impossible to react to. When you're dealing with a crowd of enemies and a moblin is among them, it can start to feel a little unfair. It also bothers me how you just have to wait for an enemy to get up after you've knocked them down to continue attacking them. Thankfully, the next game introduces a new skill that fixes this inconvenience. You know what makes combat really fun in this game though? the sound design. I'm not just talking about the battle music, I'm talking about the sound effects that play when you land a successful hit and when you send an enemy flying. <laughs> I've always really liked this aspect of battles. It's something that I'm really happy Skyward Sword brought back. Combat even extends to when you're out at sea. I mean, it's not super exciting. You can launch bombs with a cannon and use your bow and boomerang, but it's something I had to bring up anyways. Speaking of the bow, anyone else thinks it feels a little weak in this game? Like the piercing power isn't there. I think it has to do with the sound effect that plays when you shoot something. It's very quiet and not as punchy as I'd like it to be. 
but I really appreciate how you can now switch between arrow types on the fly with the right trigger. Wind Waker introduces a couple of new items for you to play with. You have a delivery bag used for delivering mail and other items throughout the game, and a bait bag for holding regular bait mainly used to get the fishman's attention, and hoi pairs that allow you to take control of a seagull to activate switches on tall peaks. The boomerang is a little different this time around, as it lets you lock onto five targets at once. It's pretty useful for clearing out those mobs of smaller enemies. New to the series is the grappling hook. In combat, it doesn't do any damage to larger foes, but it guarantees that you'll steal the monster's special drop. So for those side quests that ask you to have a certain number of joy pendants, skull necklaces, golden feathers, what have you, the grappling hook makes collecting them a lot easier. At sea, the grappling hook turns into a crane to lift up treasure chests from the bottom of the ocean, and get used to seeing this animation a lot. You can say that the grappling hook is a poor man's version of the hookshot, but I think it's different enough and has its own place in this game. The Deku Leaf also has plenty of utility. You can use it while standing to create a gust of wind that can disorient enemies and push certain items or make these special veins spin. You can also use the gust of wind to push these hanging platforms while standing on them. And you can use the Deku Leaf as a makeshift glider to glide over obstacles or reach platforms that you can't reach with a normal jump. Just don't forget to change the wind direction when outdoors. Pretty cool how this game introduced the glider 15 years before Breath of the Wild did. Actually, if we're being technical, Ocarina of Time did it first. Speaking of changing the wind direction, it wouldn't be a 3D Zelda game without some kind of musical instrument. The titular Wind Waker is used to play songs you learn throughout the game, just like the Ocarina, but also not really like the Ocarina. Playing it is kind of slow, because you have to use the left analog stick to conduct in either 3-4, 4-4, or 6-4 time, then use the right analog stick to choose one of the five notes that each play at the selected rhythm, and there's no way to speed this up. And while it's nice that the HD version doesn't play the second animation after playing the melody correctly once, it doesn't remember this the next time you load the game, so you'll have to watch that second animation for every song the first time you play them every time you start the game back up. And the Wind Waker itself is just so limited compared to the freedom you had of messing around with the Ocarina in the previous two games. Like I said in the Ocarina of Time video, there's videos on the internet of people playing actual songs using the in-game Ocarina. It's straight up impossible to do this with the Wind Waker. This is really just a nitpick, but it's a nitpick I care about a lot. Also, didn't you just adore having to play the Elegy of Emptiness over and over again in Stone Tower Temple? No? Well, tough sh** because three of Wind Waker's dungeons have you do this sort of thing again. And unfortunately, unlike Majora's Mask, these dungeons don't have much else going for them. Nothing pains me more than feeling indifferent towards a dungeon in a Zelda game. I'm the kind of person who'd rather absolutely hate something because at least I'd have more to say about it. Wind Waker's dungeons are not a strong suit. I'd say that they're the weakest part of the game, actually. None of them are bad or anything, they're just so painfully simple in their design. I have no real strong feelings about any of these one way or the other. They have neat ideas and puzzles and I think that visually they're all very interesting, but layout wise they're kinda dull if I'm being honest. But there are elements that I like about each of them. It's debatable whether the Forsaken Fortress can be counted as a dungeon since there are no small keys and it's really short, especially the second visit. But the first visit is really unique as you're forced to take a stealthy approach, as you run around the stronghold to disable the searchlights because you don't have your sword with you. This is where the ability to pick up other weapons becomes really useful, and this is the only time in the game where this barrel hiding mechanic is ever required. Beta footage shows that Link was supposed to have a sneak command, suggesting that stealth was supposed to be a more fleshed out mechanic. It's a shame this is the only remnant of that in the final version. Dragon Roost Cavern's visuals are really impressive, though they may be a little too good. The frame rate really shits the bed here. Wind Waker HD has this problem where too much action and too many effects on screen causes the performance to tank hard and it can be pretty distracting. Put that on the list of reasons as to why this game and Twilight Princess HD need to be re-released. Christ. But back to the dungeon. I'm also a fan of these parts where you have to pick up a weapon and hurl it across the room to break through or burn these wooden planks protecting a treasure chest. And this is the dungeon where you get the grappling hook, which automatically makes this one of my favorites. The Forbidden Woods features those creative uses for the Deku Leaf I talked about earlier. This place is really obsessed with having you carry and push giant nuts to progress through the next room. But other than that, I honestly think that this is one of my least favorite dungeons in the game. I don't find it to be that interesting. I'd say the Tower of the Gods is the most unique dungeon of the game. In the first part, you have to deal with a changing water level, which isn't super fun on those occasions where you have to wait for it to change again. But this dungeon likes to test your platforming skills in various rooms, and the second part of the dungeon is where you learn the command melody, a song that lets you take control of a companion character. In this dungeon's case, your companions are these statues that you have to guide to the central room. There's also a scale puzzle, and I really like scale puzzles. 
Simple as that. If I had to pick a favorite dungeon, I'd say that it's the Earth Temple. It has what I'd consider to be some of the more thought-provoking puzzles in the game, and the creepy vibe of this place is just the cherry on top. I also really like this enemy that doesn't flinch when struck with your sword, but if you time a bomb throw just right, you can destroy its skeletal body early and start attacking the head right away. And Medley is the best companion character by far. She can fly for a short period of time, and using her mirror shield in conjunction with the mirror shield you find in this dungeon leads to those creative puzzles I was mentioning. The Wind Temple is only a slight step down from the Earth Temple to me only because I don't think Makar's special ability is as good as Medley's. Other than that, its puzzles are actually a bit of a step up from the Earth Temples, and I like how the iron boots in this game are given a new purpose, now used to break through weak floors and activate these springs that launch you high in the air. You also need to use them to weigh yourself down so that when you use the hookshot on these heavy statues, you pull them towards you instead of being propelled towards them. Just try not to be in the way when they come down. The Wind Temple also has one of the few bosses in the game I actually have fun fighting against. Mulgara has the same spectacle fights like Goma and Jalhala had while not being an absolute pushover. And of course, the music here only sweetens the deal. The Helmrock King, the rematch against Phantom Ganon, the Puppet Ganon fight, and the final battle are the only other boss fights I enjoy. The others? Meh. Not that special. I mean, any boss that gives me the opportunity to use the Hurricane Spin can't be that bad, I suppose. Which is probably why I like the Savage Labyrinth so much. The Savage Labyrinth is the ultimate test of endurance and strength. You use all of the items you've obtained from exploring the dungeons and the overworld, all the heart containers you've collected, all the bottles you've found containing fairies or potions or grandma's delicious homemade soup to survive the gauntlet that awaits you. And yes, there are many floors where using the Hurricane Spin is the most viable option. The HD version kind of ruins this place a little though, since it replaces the piece of heart you used to get from clearing all 50 floors with the hero's charm instead. It lets you see enemy health bars, and you're supposed to get it from the teacher on Windfall Island instead, but it's now tucked away at the end of the most difficult challenge the game has to offer, a combat dungeon filled with enemies. That was a stupid f***ing change. The more times I replay Wind Waker, the more I start to notice the problems it has, and the more I see a game that was too ambitious for its time, resulting in some of its ideas failing to be fully realized, and a lot of its planned content being cut that could have made the finished product even better. But I'll be dead in the ground before I ever admit that it's anything less than magnificent. I love the story, the characters, the timeless presentation, and the catchy as hell soundtrack. So many things about this game just make me so happy. It's so colorful and cute. Look at Link's face when he picks up a boulder, that's so adorable. I didn't even mention the bumbling pirates, these guys are cool too. <laughs> Beetle, oh my god, I almost forgot to talk about Beetle. He's a real one, always nearby when I need to buy bait or get ripped off. The empty bottle economy is f Thank you. I'm a sucker for the fan service and all the references to Ocarina of Time. Dude, the Rido and Koroks are descendants of the Zora and Kokiri, that's, that's so cool. I even love the details that most people wouldn't pay any mind to, like the light particles that come out when you draw the fully powered Master Sword and the way Link's hair blows in the wind when he runs. And there's the Great Sea itself, Wind Waker's claim to fame, and it holds up remarkably well as this massive place where one could create their own adventure. This is probably the Zelda game I have replayed the most, and while the nostalgia goggles do come off more and more as I get older, I have never doubted Wind Waker's quality. I'd say it's one of the most replayable games in the series due to the amount of freedom you're given. Sometimes I procrastinate and leave everything till the end of the game as I'm doing the Triforce quest. Other times I'll try to do as much as I can during the Endless Night. I might do a playthrough on Normal Mode, another on Hero Mode, another on the GameCube version with better Wind Waker. Maybe I'll even try out a randomizer one day. I'm sure Wind Waker's design lends itself very well to those. Sometimes I'll even start a new game from a completed save file to activate the second quest, where Link's hero tunic is invisible so he's basically wearing his Outset Island outfit for the whole game. The second quest also translates all the Hylian text, actually letting you understand what's being talked about in those scenes. I have a lot of nostalgia for the Wind Waker, and nostalgia for my childhood in general. When everything in my life seemed so much simpler, when I actually had the time to play a game like this and let myself be guided solely by my instincts, my imagination, and a notebook and pencil. It's hard not to wish for those days to return. It's hard not to notice just how much scarier and crueler the world looks now at times. But 
If all I do is romanticize the past, I can never hope to grow. I can never hope to enjoy the present or look forward to what awaits me in the future. So I refuse to be chained to the past. I still have a whole life ahead of me. New memories to make, new adventures to go on, new horizons to explore. I'm grateful to Wind Waker for showing me the joys of exploring the unknown, for making me laugh and cry for over 10 years now. Is it the best Zelda game ever made? Who knows? But it will always be the most special one to me. Thanks for watching.